If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 21 Desperate Pirates Noir quickened his pace, his sword slashing wildly, sending deadly waves of sword energy that left his enemies either dead or seriously injured. The pirates could no longer hold back the increasingly frenzied Noir. York, in the crowd, looked terrified as he stepped back, clearly planning to abandon his comrades and escape. Frowning, Noir thrust his sword forward and slashed through the pirates blocking his path before slashing at York. York, stunned, managed to draw his fine sword to block the attack. A powerful force passed through the blade, causing York's hand to tremble in pain and nearly causing him to drop his weapon. Seizing the opportunity, Noir kicked York, sending him flying, and quickly snatched the fine pure heart sword from his grasp. Holding his new prize, Noir's eyes gleamed with excitement and he grinned broadly. This trip was worth it, he got both money and a fine sword. Pure heart was a long sword, and despite Noir's height and arm length, it still felt a bit mismatched. But with his rapid growth, it wouldn't be long before he could use it perfectly. The sword had a snow-white blade with green patterns etched into it. It was heavy and fit Noir's aesthetic perfectly. A fine sword, and now it's mine. Noir said, satisfied. York, coughing blood and looking desperate, didn't care that the boy had taken his sword. From their brief exchange, he could tell that their strengths were not on the same level. Known for his cautious nature, York decided to flee. He could always find another place to raid. But Noir was here for York's head and wouldn't let him get away. Trying to run? Let's test this new sword. Noir stopped smiling, sheathed his old sword and held pure heart with both hands, aiming at York's retreating back. Noir shot forward like an arrow, quickly catching up to York and slashing at his back with pure heart. A flash of green light mixed with blood split York's back open, spurting blood. York fell into a pool of blood with a hideous scream, quickly becoming a lifeless corpse. Our captain is dead. How is that possible? How could York? This boy is a devil. A devil. The psychological pillar of a pirate crew is its captain. When the pirates saw Noir easily break through their defenses and kill their leader, they panicked. Their terrified screams spread fear among the pirates, and many fled without even retrieving their captain's body. Noir looked sympathetically at York's body and said, It seems you weren't very important to your subordinates. No one even stayed with you. If York could hear him, he would undoubtedly curse Noir with tears of frustration. Meanwhile, the fleeing pirates had forgotten about their leader. One pirate suddenly said, there's a lot of treasure in York's treasury. Since he's dead, why don't we share it? At the thought of York's accumulated wealth, the pirates' eyes reddened with greed, and they happily agreed and headed for the treasury. But when they found the treasury, they were stunned. Why was it empty? Not a single coin was left. Even a rat would have left something behind. As they stood there in shock, a pirate ran over and shouted, there's a ship on the shore. The bastards on that ship have taken all our money. What? The pirates, furious, drew their weapons and rushed to the shore. That devil boy might be too strong for them, but they could still deal with those thieves. On the ship, Nami happily instructed Kaed and Naomi to organize the stolen treasures. Using her unique treasure sense, Nami quickly found York's hiding place and emptied it. Had Kaed and Naomi not dragged her away, she would have dismantled and packed the gilded door as well. Nami's eyes sparkled with joy at the sight of the treasure-laden ship. She loved berries and shiny things the most. Damn thieves! Give us back our money! Cowards! Come down and fight! Give it back! Nami, drooling with joy, snapped out of her daze at the approaching shouts. Not good, the pirates are coming. Let's go! Nami's face turned pale as she ordered Kaed to set sail quickly. Kaed hesitated, but Master isn't back yet. Ah! Nami was worried but she quickly spotted Noir on the shore, excitedly shouting, Brother, hurry! We took all their money. Noir, standing on the shore with York's head wrapped in a black cloth, sympathized with the pirates. In one day, they lost their leader and their money. So pitiful! But why was there so much money on his ship? Noir realized what was happening from Nami's screams and muttered, That girl is always making trouble. Noir gracefully jumped onto the ship. Nami said excitedly, Look, brother. We got so much money. Noir wanted to scold her, but he couldn't bring himself to do so with her glowing, excited face. York is taken care of and we have the money. Forget the small fry. Let's go. Noir ordered. 
Kaed and Naomi replied excitedly, Yes, master. The pirates, seeing the murderer of their captain and the thieves together, were devastated. Who were these bandits? Seeing the desperate pirates, Noir felt even happier. But when he saw Nami celebrating with Kaed and Naomi, he thought. The Arlong story had changed, but Nami still loved berries and stole them. Could it be? Nami's nature? P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 22, My Money After Arlong invaded Kokoyasi village, ten-year-old Nami endured the humiliation and joined the Arlong pirates to protect the villagers. She agreed to Arlong's condition, if she could collect 100 million berries, the village would be freed. To accomplish this, Nami resorted to deception and theft, using her extraordinary skills to steal from the pirates. However, Arlong broke his promise and conspired with Captain Nezumi to steal Nami's savings, prompting the Straw Hat pirates to fight Arlong for Nami. At first, Noir believed that Nami's love for berries stemmed from her tragic experiences, which made her value money and excel at theft. But now Noir realized that Nami's affinity for berries and her expertise in deception were innate talents. The target has acquired a new talent. Please check, host. When Noir heard the system's voice, he twitched slightly. Could this be it? When he checked Nami, who originally only had a red talent, he now saw a new one. Little Thief Cat, white quality. Valued money highly, possesses exceptional deception skills. The success rate of theft or deception depends on the enemy's intelligence, up to 100%. Dot. Noir sighed. Sweet little Nami had inherited her traditional skills, but why was it only a low-quality white talent? The system explained, acquired talents are different from innate ones and can be upgraded as skills improve. Noir nodded. Devil fruit powers are a prime example of acquired talents. For example, Luffy's gum gum fruit started at a low quality, but developed significantly with his abilities, especially after the two-year time jump. Seeing Nami hugging a bundle of berries with a blissful expression on her face, Noir's face twisted into a mischievous grin. Little one, if I can't handle you, someone else will. Do you think Belmere would let you go? While counting the money, Nami suddenly felt a shiver run down her spine, sensing imminent danger. She looked suspiciously at Noir, who smiled innocently and showed no intention of taking her money. Relieved, she resumed counting. The journey back was quick and uneventful, with no minor pirates to slow them down. Noir's party soon returned to Kokoyasi village, where Belmere and Nojiko were waiting on the shore. When Belmere discovered that her daughter had left, she was worried until she saw that her children had returned safely. But her expression changed to shock when she saw the berries on the ship. Was this voyage so profitable? Nami was worried because she had stolen the money and didn't dare look Belmere in the eye. But Belmere paid no attention to her, because Noir was busy telling the story. Exaggerating the story, Noir complained, Belmere, while I was fighting, Nami sneaked off to steal money. Not only that, but she kept all the stolen money for herself and refused to share any. Really? Belmere's anger rose, her fists clenched. Absolutely. Noir nodded vigorously, his two disciples nodding frantically behind him. Belmere took a deep breath and said quietly, Don't worry, Noir. She'll cough up every cent. Smiling, Belmere approached the confused Nami. Noir covered his mouth and chuckled. Belmere, smiling, said to the uneasy Nami, your brother says you are very capable, stealing money from pirates. Relieved that Belmere wasn't scolding her, Nami smiled innocently. Yes, Belmere. I can buy a lot of treats with it. Didn't you share it with your brother and the others? Belmere asked. Nami paused, realizing that Noir hadn't asked for any. She shook her head. No. Hearing this, Belmere said, I'm so happy for you, Nami, that you have so much money. Feeling that something was wrong, Nami's smile faltered. Before she could answer, Belmere continued, Since you're young, it's easy to lose money. I'll keep it for you. Nami, panicking, stammered, I. Belmere cut her off, Don't worry, Nami. I won't take it. You'll get it back when you're older. Nami, frustrated but afraid to defy Belmere, could only watch helplessly. Belmere, satisfied, shouted, Bring the money down. Yes. Delighted to witness the confiscation, Noir eagerly complied. A young Nami couldn't outsmart Belmere. Under Nami's pained gaze, the treasure was taken home and placed in Belmere's safe, 
not Nami's. Afterwards, Belmir shared some berries with Noir and his disciples, who celebrated happily. Nami, biting her handkerchief, wept bitterly. My money. Later, Noir sent Ka'ed and Naomi with York's head to the navy to collect the bounty, none of which went to Nami. Thus Noir made his debut as a pirate hunter, gaining fame for killing Kembra, York, and defeating Arlong. He quickly became a rising star in the East Blue. As the years passed, Noir's power grew and his bounty kills increased, earning him considerable fame among the East Blue Navy, hunters, and pirates. He was eventually dubbed the strongest pirate hunter in East Blue. In Belmere's house in the village of Kokoyasi, the now famous Noir sat in his room, opened his eyes, and exclaimed excitedly. At 17, I've finally awakened Conqueror Haki. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 23 Farewell to the Village With the help of the golden talent Conqueror's Aptitude, Noir finally awakened the last of the three types of Haki, the Conqueror's Haki, at the age of 17. System, show me my statistics. Noir called softly to the system, and a light screen displaying his various attributes appeared before his eyes. Host, Kairos D. Noir. Physique, 450, Max 999. Swordsmanship, 498, Max 999. Charisma, 94, Max 100. Armament Hacky, 62, Max 100. Observation Hacky, 50, Max 100. Conqueror Hacky, 10, Max 100. Possessions, Red Talent Copy CARD1. Talents, Otherworldly Guest, Devil Host Bear, Conqueror's Aptitude, Dominant Swordsmanship, Climate Super Perception. Now, Noir's attributes were much fuller compared to when he first arrived in this world. Especially his charisma, which was a high 94 points. Noir could say this with confidence. He was the most handsome guy across the ocean. However, his once proud physique had been stuck for a long time, seemingly stuck in a bottleneck. Despite this, Noir had grown to an impressive height of over 2 meters, something he couldn't have imagined in his previous life. As Noir admired his physique, Belmere knocked and entered the room. Noir smiled and said, Belmere, you're here. Belmere looked a bit complicated and said, You've grown up so fast, I can't hold you back anymore. Noir quickly shook his head and said, No way. I just want to see a bigger world. Belmere sighed, then smiled again and said, I don't want to hold you back, I just hate to let you go. Noir smiled too, feeling a mixture of emotions. Sailing out at 17 and going to the Grand Line had been Noir's idea for a long time. But he had formed bonds in Kokoyasi village, especially with Nami and the others, that made him reluctant to leave. However, it was Belmere who encouraged him to go on adventures, so Noir finally decided to set sail. There were not many people of note left in the East Blue. To find stronger talents to copy, he had to go to the Grand Line. Besides, according to the story, it was almost certain that Nami would join the Straw Hat Pirates. Noir couldn't just stay behind and cheer her on from afar. He had to get stronger before the story unfolded. Noir packed his belongings, hung the fine great sword Pure Heart at his waist, and donned a super cool black and white gradient coat. Fully prepared, Noir stepped out of the house only to find the street crowded with people. Genso, with his usual stern face and a windmill spinning on his head, stood in front of Noir and said, Out there, don't disgrace our village. Noir, touched by the familiar faces, said softly, Of course not. The villagers escorted Noir to the shore where a boat was waiting. Noir thanked everyone and said, Thank you for seeing me off. I'm leaving now. Nojiko and Nami, now young women, hugged Noir's waist and said sadly, Brother, take care. Noir patted their heads, then looked at the sobbing Ka'ed and Naomi and said, Why are you crying? I'm not dead yet. Listen, be careful during the bounty hunt and take care of the villagers, okay? Noir instructed. The sisters nodded firmly and shouted, Yes, master. Noir finished his goodbyes, boarded the boat, hoisted the sail, and shouted back to the waving villagers, Goodbye. Wait for my return. Goodbye. You better make a name for yourself, kid. Stay safe. The villagers cheerfully bid Noir farewell. Belmere with a cigarette in her mouth and a bright smile, looked extremely dashing. Nami and Nojiko waved frantically. Nojiko's face showed reluctance, but also pride for her brother. Nami, remembering her dream, 
said to Nojiko, brother has set sail to become the strongest in the world. And I want to draw the first complete map of the world. One day, I'll set sail to fulfill my dream, too. After a moment of surprise, Nojiko smiled at the confident girl and said, I believe in you. Standing at the bow of the boat, Noir waved goodbye, feeling a growing sense of melancholy. This departure was emotionally complex. Not knowing how long he would be on the Grand Line, he knew it would be a long time before he saw everyone again. Sighing, Noir returned to the deck, sat down on a deck chair, and began to plan. According to the map, Noir still had a long way to go before reaching Reverse Mountain, the starting point of the Grand Line, so there was no rush. He wanted to visit a good place in the East Blue first. The Baratai, a floating restaurant where Sanji had worked before he left, and a famous gourmet spot in the East Blue. Remembering the Baratai's reputation, Noir's eyes shone and he drooled slightly. He had often heard of it during his bounty hunts, but had never had the chance to visit. Now he could finally go there and have a proper meal. And maybe check out Sanji's talents. Lazily, Noir's boat sailed away. It was a pleasant trip. But soon Noir felt bored. With nothing to do on a well-stocked ship in the vast ocean, loneliness became his greatest enemy. To pass the time, aboard Noir took out dumbbells from the cabin and began to work out. Meanwhile, on a nearby deserted island, a green-haired young man stood on a large blue rock and looked out to sea. He was wearing a white t-shirt, three drop-shaped golden earrings on one ear, and three swords at his waist. With half-closed eyes and an irritated expression, Zoro muttered to himself, Where the hell am I? P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 24, Zoro Lost Zoro sat cross-legged on the ground, recalling his master's words just before he left Shimatsuki village. Zoro, take this map. Follow the directions, and you'll find a town where you can buy supplies. He unfurled the map given by Master Koshiro, rested his chin on his hand, and studied it intently. After a while, he muttered, I didn't take a wrong turn, did I? But where's the town? Zoro glanced at the desolate wilderness around him, deeply questioning his place in the world. To make matters worse, after arriving on the island, a wave had capsized his small boat, leaving him with no way back. Just when Zoro was at a loss, not knowing what to do, a sailboat slowly passed by the island. Zoro was momentarily stunned, then shouted joyfully, Hey! Can you stop for a moment? Noir, who was lifting weights on the boat, was also surprised by the shout. That voice sounds so familiar. Turning around, he saw the familiar green moss head and the three swords. Zoro? Noir was shocked. He had just set sail and already ran into someone from the main crew. He hadn't planned on seeking out Zoro. But what was going on? Was he lost again? Since he'd seen him, he couldn't just ignore it. Noir steered the boat to the shore, and the green moss head immediately sprinted toward him. But, why was he running the wrong way? Noir watched in disbelief as Zoro, despite starting on a straight path, took a sharp turn and ran off in the opposite direction. Is this even getting lost? This must be some kind of condition. Noir's eyelid twitched, and he shouted, Over here. After a considerable amount of chaos, Noir finally managed to get Zoro on board. As expected, he was lost. Once on the boat, Zoro laughed with relief and thanked Noir, Thank you. Noir waved it off and used his system to examine Zoro's abilities. Name, Zoro. Heart of the world's greatest swordsman, golden quality. Aiming to be the world's greatest swordsman, his killing intent and willpower rival any swordsman. His swordsmanship talent is at the world's pinnacle, with incredible development and comprehension abilities, giving him an edge over all other swordsmen. Perpetually lost, purple quality, an extraordinary ability to get lost. Regardless of speed, distance, or guidance, there's a high chance of getting lost and straying off course. Three sword style master, purple quality, a self created three sword style increasing destructive power and attack range. In battles against multiple enemies, the three sword styles offensive and defensive capabilities are enhanced. Restful sleep, blue quality, tends to become sleepy. Injuries and stamina recover faster during sleep, with excellent sleep quality. Impressive, he had four talents. Being perpetually lost was firmly among them, and it was even a standout purple talent. It matched the quality of Zoro's signature three sword style. Noir eyed the golden talent in Zoro's list enviously but unfortunately, he had no golden copy cards left. 
apart from the three sword style master talent, the rest didn't interest him much. Becoming perpetually lost or sleepy, even with the recovery benefits, wasn't appealing. Thinking of how Zoro on the straw hat ship was either training or sleeping made Noir feel hesitant. Zoro noticed Noir's changing expressions and asked curiously, What's wrong with you? Noir adjusted his expression and said, Nothing, I'll drop you off at a town soon. Zoro nodded, his eyes sweeping over Noir. Seeing the sword at his waist, he asked in surprise, Are you a swordsman? Noir smiled and nodded, Of course. Oh, this should be interesting. Zoro's eyes seemed to ignite with excitement as he grinned, Are you strong? Noir quickly guessed what Zoro was thinking and smiled confidently, At least in the East Blue, I haven't lost. Really? Zoro stood up, drew the white long sword from his waist, and said, Can you spar with me? Noir raised an eyebrow with interest and drew his sword lightly, Do you think you can beat me? Zoro bit down on Wado Ikimanji, drew two plain long swords, and with fighting spirit, declared. For a promise, I will become the world's greatest swordsman, and to do that, I must defeat everyone. Starting with the three sword style, Zoro was serious. Noir raised his sword to his chest. Zoro took a stance with his three swords, and without a word, they were ready to fight. Biting the sword and lowering his head, Zoro thrust the two swords in his hands outward, then quickly dropped his waist, and the three swords shot forward like a charging bull's horns. The move was incredibly swift, leaving little time for a normal person to react, but Noir's observation Haki was constantly active, making this speed insignificant. Bull Needle Zoro's deep shout rang out. Noir raised his sword swiftly blocking the two blades aimed at his chest, and with a quick force, he easily pushed Zoro back. Zoro, retreating a few steps, looked at Noir in disbelief. This man had effortlessly broken his attack with one hand? But he didn't lose focus. Using his momentum, he crossed the two swords behind him and lunged like a tiger, shouting, Tiger Hunt! The three swords came at him again with overwhelming pressure, but Noir frowned, swinging his sword to block the core of the three sword style. With a light flick of his sword, Zoro quickly pulled back, narrowly avoiding the blade that brushed past his throat and chin. Damn it! Zoro said angrily. After so many attacks, he hadn't even touched Noir's clothes, but a single counterattack had left him in such a sorry state. The names are good, but they're too flashy, Noir commented, shaking his sword. In battles between swordsmen of the same level, various techniques could indeed increase victory chances. However, Noir's swordsmanship was solidly above Zoro's, rendering his flashy named moves ineffective. Noir had wanted to name his moves, but he was terrible at it, feeling envious of Zoro's creativity. Zoro, driven by an unyielding spirit, bit down harder on Wado Ikimanji, and with a resolute shout, swung his swords again, Onigiri. Noir's eyes brightened. For the first time, he moved to meet the attack, saying, Let me show you the difference between us. With a simple upward slash, Noir's sword carried a force that could cut through steel. The clash of swords echoed in the air. Zoro stood, still holding his two swords, but their blades were shattered and scattered on the ground. Noir sheathed his undamaged sword and said, You're not the only one who wants to become the world's greatest. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 25, Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu Zoro sat there staring at his broken swords and felt a sudden bitterness rise in his heart. He had lost. He had barely left his master's dojo and already tasted defeat. Silently, Zoro sheathed his Wado Ikimanji and said darkly, There really are many people stronger than me. Noir smiled. It was good that Zoro recognized his own shortcomings. In the original story, Zoro fought without much pressure before meeting My Hawk, leaving no room for growth. Noir leaned down and patted Zoro's shoulder saying, if you want to become the greatest swordsman in the world, you can't let failure defeat you. Zoro's eyes immediately lit up and he said firmly, of course not. After sheathing his Wado Ikimanji, Zoro looked at Noir and asked, what is your name? Confidently, Noir replied, Kairos de Noir. I don't just want to be a great swordsman, I want to be the true greatest in the world. The world's greatest. Despite his defeat, Zoro felt his ambition grow stronger. He declared confidently, I am Rorano Azoro, and I will defeat you to become the greatest swordsman. Noir laughed heartily and said, I hope you really can do that. Noir didn't doubt Zoro's swordsmanship talent, but defeating him, especially with the help of the system, 
would be almost impossible. Meet an important character, Zoro. Rewards have been issued, mastery of Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu, one red talent copy card, plus ten to swordsmanship. Hearing the system's cold prompt, Noir was overjoyed. Another red copy card and a ten-point increase in swordsmanship. Now, his swordsmanship had officially surpassed the 500-point mark making him capable of fighting strong opponents even in the new world. And Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu. Noir was confused and asked the system, is this the Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu I think it is? From Rurouni Kenshin. Could the system actually reward powers from other anime? Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu, which originated from the work Rurouni Kenshin, has been adapted by the system to be suitable for use in this world. Noir was delighted. He had thought that the system could only give rewards from the One Piece world, but now even the swordplay from Rurouni Kenshin was available. It seemed that he would have to find more characters from the original story to get rewards. Seeing Noir's excited expression, Zoro asked curiously, What are you doing? Ahem, nothing. Noir noticed Zoro's tattered clothes and asked, Are you out of money? Why do you look so shabby? Zoro, leaning against the wall, said gloomily, I've spent all my travel expenses and now I don't know where to earn more. Noir was stunned and asked, Aren't you a bounty hunter now? Bounty hunter? What's that? Zoro asked, confused. Noir explained it to him, and Zoro's eyes lit up as he said, From now on, I'm going to earn money doing this. I'll be the strongest hunter in East Blue. Noir pointed at himself with pride and said, By the way, I am the strongest hunter in East Blue. Zoro's face went dark under his green hair. The proud Zoro pretended to be deaf closed his eyes, and fell asleep. So Noir and Zoro travelled together for a while. Although Zoro was silent as a grave, Noir at least had someone to talk to. Zoro, who liked silence, was almost driven crazy by this talkative guy. Fortunately, after a while, Noir's ship discovered a village, and Zoro quickly ran off the ship to escape Noir's endless chatter. Zoro smiled and waved to Noir, saying goodbye. Noir reluctantly waved back at his brief companion. With his only sword at his side, Zoro walked down the main street of the village and soon spotted a bustling tavern. Zoro's eyes lit up. Although he knew he had no money, he couldn't resist going inside. Upon entering the tavern, he asked for a drink at the bar. The tavern owner, seeing Zoro's shabby appearance, sneered and asked, Hey, do you have money? Don't eat and drink for free here. Facing the owner's skepticism, Zoro calmly replied, Ah. I don't have any money not a single coin. Hey! The owner was about to get angry when suddenly, a loud noise erupted and the tavern door was kicked open. A group of fierce-looking men burst in, grinning at the frightened patrons, ha ha ha, a bunch of weaklings. Hand over your money! Zoro frowned and asked the tavern owner, who are these idiots? The owner covered Zoro's mouth in fear and said, this man has a bounty of 1.2 million belly. He's a pirate who kills and burns. Pirate? Hearing the bounty, Zoro remembered Noir's words and had an idea. Here was his drinking money. Silently, Zoro approached the pirates. The pirate leader saw someone approaching and yelled, What are you doing? Hand over your money. Without a word, Zoro unsheathed his sword and made a quick slash. The pirate leader, who had been boasting just moments ago, had a bloodline appear on his neck. Why? The pirate leader fell to the ground, dead with a terrified expression on his face. The tavern fell silent. No one dared to speak, all eyes filled with awe as they looked at Zoro. Returning to the bar, Zoro said, Now I have money. Give me a drink. Yes sure, right away. Sitting on the chair, Zoro rested his chin and thought, Bounty hunter, a convenient profession indeed. Meanwhile, back on his ship, Noir had no idea about Zoro's actions. He looked anxiously at the sea in front of him. Was he cursed by Zoro? Why did he realize he was off course after sailing for so long? After dropping off Zoro and returning to his route, Noir took a nap on his ship, only to wake up to find that his ship had gone off course. Where was he now? Hmm? Something felt wrong. Noir, with his heightened sense of weather, noticed that as he sailed into this area, the air seemed to grow thicker. He soon discovered the reason. Not far from his ship, an eerie white fog had silently enveloped the area. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 26, Lost in the Fog 
Noir was startled and tried to change direction, but the fog, like a conscious beast, quickly engulfed his ship. The surroundings turned into a white expanse. Noir hit his head in frustration, he had been too careless. He thought that with Nami's god-level navigational skills, everything would be fine. But the sudden fog gave him a harsh reality check. This fog doesn't seem to be naturally formed, he thought. Having learned the basics of navigation from Nami, Noir knew a little about the sea. In this thick fog, the currents seemed to follow a strange pattern. His compass was useless, its needle spinning wildly. What worried Noir even more was that this fog, like a sticky substance, not only obscured his vision, but also dulled his heightened sense of the weather. With his navigational skills sealed, Noir was helpless and could only rely on his hacky to sense the environment. There was indeed some activity, but it wasn't on the surface, it was underwater. Boom! A surge of power came from the sea, sending huge waves into the sky and lifting Noir's ship into the air. Two ferocious sea beasts rode the waves, opening their bloody mouths to bite the ship from both sides. Grabbing the railing, Noir fearlessly lunged at one of the beasts. Drawing his pure heart sword, he leaped over the sea beast, raised his blade, and slashed down with fierce sword energy. A huge gush of blood erupted from the beast's head, and it roared in pain. Using its head as a springboard, Noir propelled himself toward the other beast. Let's test Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu's moves on you. With his black eyes gleaming, Noir swung his waist and feet in the air, grabbed his pure heart sword backwards, and slashed at the beast's head. Ritsuzen. A terrifying sword light flashed, and the violent slash nearly pierced the sea beast's entire body. Both beasts were badly injured and fell back into the sea. Noir gracefully landed on the deck, sheathing his sword. As the blood spread over the water, Noir could feel more sea beasts being drawn to him through his hacky. Damn, Noir muttered, staring at the sea below. It would be nice to have a crew to fight these beasts with him. Instead, he was on his own, busy to the point of exhaustion. A group of sea creatures, attracted by the blood, swam towards the ship. Just as Noir prepared to face them again, a clear whistle suddenly echoed through the dense fog. As if responding to a command, the sea creatures immediately left Noir's ship and swam toward the source of the whistle. Noir was stunned. Were the sea creatures so organized? He decided to follow the beasts to find the source of the whistle. Whoever controlled the sea beasts could help him escape the fog. But Noir overestimated the speed of his ship. The sea beasts swam frantically, and he soon lost them. It wasn't a big deal, though. He was close enough to sense several figures in the distance with his hacky. There were many of them, and one of them had a particularly strong aura, though not as strong as Noir's, indicating a formidable fighter from East Blue. Interestingly, their ship seemed to have been destroyed and all of them were in the water. Suddenly, someone riding on something quickly approached Noir. A man dressed like a native, riding a dolphin-like sea beast, raced towards him like a speedboat. Die, outsider! The native, his face painted with red stripes, spoke in a savage tone. He held a spear in his hand, and with the help of the sea beast, he swiftly climbed onto Noir's ship, aiming for Noir's head. The barbarian's sudden attack infuriated Noir. Did he think he could kill him so easily? Noir scornfully caught the spear with his bare hands and crushed the shaft with a quick squeeze. After destroying the weapon, he kicked the native in the face, causing his nose to bleed instantly. Damn. The man knocked down by Noir lunged at him again, trying to strangle him with his hands. Angered by this tactic, Noir activated his devil fruit ability. His form grew larger, his grotesque bare face exuding a strong sense of intimidation. He grabbed the man with his massive bear paw. Seeing Noir turn into a bear, the man's face showed fear as he shouted, A bear! You're a devil! Noir grinned and said, A devil? You try to kill me without a word and call me a devil. With a powerful squeeze, a crunching sound was heard and the native howled in pain. Nearly crushing the man, Noir threw him back into the sea, where his fanged, red-spotted, dolphin-like sea beast quickly rescued him. As he fled, the man shouted, Wait, outsider! Red Leaf Island will be your grave! Noir watched him disappear and sneered, Don't worry, I'll find you soon. As he approached the group of humans, Noir could hear the sounds of battle. Were they fighting the natives as well? As his ship drew closer, Noir finally saw the people in the water through the thick fog. A group of humans riding red-spotted sea beasts held spears in their hands, eyeing their enemies like prey. Four people were swimming in the water, near the wreckage of a ship that had probably been destroyed by the sea beasts. 
Despite the ship's condition, Noir recognized it as a pirate vessel by the skull flag floating in the sea. Among the natives was the man Noir had chased away. He whispered something to a leader-like figure who then became angry. Ignoring the natives, who looked like clowns, Noir curiously examined the four pirates in the water. A small crew of pirates, not new, but like redhairs, each a tough character. Among the four, the face of a young man caught Noir's attention. Noir stared at him and murmured, that face, those freckles, they look so familiar. Chapter 27, Fishman Karate Demonstrates Its Power Black hair, black eyes, freckles on his face, and an orange hat with a smiley face and a crying face pattern on it. Noir was stunned. Is this Ace? Why am I meeting him here? Oh, right. If we consider the age, Noir and Ace are the same age. He has set out to sea, and Ace should have become a pirate by now. It's quite normal. Noir saw Ace and his companions looking at him blankly and greeted them, Hello. Ace saw a large ship approaching, and the ship's owner greeted him. He naturally realized that Noir and those people weren't together, so he said happily. Hey there. Can we come aboard to take shelter? We can't fight properly in the water. Noir smiled and nodded, saying, Just in time, I have a grudge against those guys too. Come aboard. Ace was delighted. He grabbed a crew member with each hand and climbed aboard the ship, followed by another companion holding a sniper rifle. Back on the ship, the pirates immediately regained their confidence. Ace laughed excitedly towards the sky, standing at the bow and shouting at the natives, Come on. Let's continue the fight. Noir noticed that Ace had been soaked in seawater for so long without any issues, so he understood. It seemed Ace hadn't eaten the devil fruit yet. Otherwise, Ace would have charged up and unleashed a fire fist, turning those guys to ash. The natives, relying on the sea beasts, began to disperse and surround Noir's ship on the water's surface. You foolish outsiders, thinking you can approach our sacred land and even injure our people. The leader, with the most solid muscles and a face painted with strange red graffiti lines, unemotionally sentenced Noir and his companions to death. Ace shouted angrily, You guys were the ones who commanded those sea beasts to attack our ship first. You started it. The native who had been taught a lesson by Noir pointed at Noir and the others, shouting, Kassa! Stop wasting words with them. Feed them to our scarlet dolphins. The barbarian leader, known as Kassa, snorted coldly, took out a wooden whistle from his neck, took a deep breath, and blew it. One of Ace's crew members frowned and said, They're summoning sea beasts again. They had fallen for this trick before. Whenever that whistle was blown, many sea beasts would rush up from the sea. Their ship had been flipped like this on the spot. In Noir's observation, many large figures surged from the sea towards the bottom of the ship. Noir frowned and said, You guys watch the ship for me. I'll handle the troubles underwater. Noir took a deep breath and jumped into the water just as Ace shouted, Wait, I'll come with you. The remaining three crew members bitterly watched the deck as a group of natives jumped aboard, surrounding them. Can't we talk this out? Do you dare to fight one on one? Underwater, Noir and Ace watched the swarm of sea beasts surging up, and Noir's face darkened. There were just too many of them. These natives had some truly vicious thoughts. Ace clenched his fists, charged into the swarm, and started fighting. Even though Ace hadn't eaten the flame flame fruit yet, his combat abilities were impressive. A human charging into the swarm of sea beasts barehanded, knocking each sea beast flying with a single punch. His quick attacks against the sea beasts created large bubbles underwater, and wave after wave of enemies were immediately restrained. Not to be outdone, Noir demonstrated his fishman karate. Ever since obtaining the fishman karate training manual, Noir's combat abilities had skyrocketed, but he had never fought underwater before. Noir took a stance, lightly spreading his arms, his palms gently opening, and a blue light seemed to glow at his fingertips, taking on a webbed form. Gunave, Group Rain Silently chanting the name of the technique, Noir swung his arms forward with force. The water currents condensed around him, launching like cannonballs. Several powerful water currents became extremely powerful underwater. Each gunave, as powerful as explosives, struck the sea beast swarm, creating massive disturbances in the ocean. The waves of attacking fish were instantly repelled. Facing Noir's fierce gaze, they hesitated to approach but were unwilling to leave. Ace, holding his breath, couldn't speak, but he stared wide-eyed at Noir, then gave a thumbs up in admiration. Noir proudly raised an eyebrow at him and waved for him to move aside. 
Ace hesitated, then swam away from the battle, distancing himself from the sea beasts. Noir placed his fists on his waist, then moved his hands along the ocean currents, making an over-the-shoulder throw gesture. Derived from Fishman Karate, Fishman Jiu-Jitsu allowed for better control of water currents than Karate. Sea Current Over-Shoulder Throw With the gesture of an over-the-shoulder throw, Noir grasped the water behind him, sending a torrent of waves forward like a flood. The devastating currents struck the fish swarm. Even the sea creatures couldn't withstand this calamity-like attack, all being driven back to the depths. Noir was thrilled, looking at the dark seabed. He hadn't expected Fishman Karate to be so powerful underwater. It was far superior to a certain someone's village policeman combat skills. Ace, seeing the enemies repelled, happily approached and patted Noir, bubbles emerging from his mouth as if he were complimenting him. Noir pointed upwards, and Ace nodded, and the two swam back to the ship. Meanwhile, on the ship, Ace's three crew members fought defensively against the natives. It must be said that the companions valued by the future Fire Fist Ace were not weak. The three fought against many, surprisingly holding on for so long. Many enemies lay on the ground, while they were only lightly injured. One blue-haired youth with a deep blue eye mask said worriedly, Why hasn't Ace returned? We can't hold on much longer. A man with a skull mask and numerous skull-themed accessories said firmly, We must hold on until the captain returns. They are fighting the sea beasts. If we can't even hold off these guys, how can we follow the captain? The last person, wearing a top hat and holding a sniper rifle, fired shots calmly. Enemies fell before they could react. Hidden under the top hat, his face showed no expression, but his eyes suddenly sharpened, and a slight smile appeared as he said, They're back. Before the words finished, Noir and Ace broke through the surface, jumping back onto the deck. Ace, stretching his muscles, shouted menacingly, you dare bully my crew. I'm going to settle the score with you all. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 28, The Benevolent Flames of Amaterasu Upon hearing Ace's bold proclamation, his crew members were so moved that they almost wept. But the faces of the natives turned green when they heard his words. We bullied your people? Are you blind? Can't you see that all those lying on the ground are our brothers? Their leader, Kassa, looked even more fierce and ordered through clenched teeth, capture these guys and offer them to the great shaman. Yes. The natives attacked again, but now that the battle was on the ship, Ace could fully unleash his abilities, especially with Noir's help. The situation quickly turned in their favor. Despite being outnumbered, the poorly armed and averagely strong natives could not withstand their attacks and began to retreat. With no other choice, Kassa shouted to his men, We are no match for them retreat. Trying to run. Noir's eyes narrowed, and a not yet refined wave of conqueror's hacky surged from him, causing a strange disturbance in the air. The fleeing natives shuddered as if they had seen a ghost. Plop. Plop. One by one, they fell into the water as if rushing to their deaths. Without a struggle, those who jumped overboard fainted and sank into the sea. Those who had threatened to feed Noir to the fish also fell in. It seemed that they themselves would end up in the bellies of the fish. A few who didn't jump foamed at the mouth and collapsed on the deck. Only Kassa, trembling and rolling his eyes, managed to stay on his knees without falling. Ace looked at Noir with a sense of understanding, feeling that the power he had just seen was somehow familiar. Surprised by Kassa's resilience, Noir thought to himself, his luck is pretty strong. Although his conqueror's hacky was still at a basic level, it should have been enough to deal with these guys. Not too worried, Noir grabbed Kassa by the neck and commanded harshly, lead the way. I want to meet your great shaman. Kassa, eyes blazing with anger, cursed, you despicable brat, what sorcery did you use? The great shaman will call down heavenly fire and burn you to ashes. Ace replied in disgust, you tried to kill us first. Should we just stand there and let you do it? Heavenly fire? Noir's interest was piqued. A user of fire abilities? Considering that Ace was here, could the previous user of the flame fruit be that great shaman? That made it all the more necessary to go. Noir slapped Cass's graffiti-covered face twice and said coldly, Lead the way. No more nonsense or I'll rip your tongue out. The once tough Cassa immediately succumbed to the threat and obediently began to lead the way. According to him, the sea beasts they were using, called red-spotted dolphins, nested under the island where Cass's tribe lived, allowing them to easily navigate through the thick fog. 
when they finally found the right direction, everyone on board breathed a sigh of relief. Ace thanked Noir enthusiastically and introduced himself, Hi, I'm Porgas D. Ace, captain of the Spade Pirates. That masked guy over there is Deuce, a doctor. The one covered in skull decorations is Skull, a hardcore pirate fan and collector of skull-themed items. And that guy is Myhar, a sniper. Don't be fooled by his shyness, his marksmanship is top-notch. Myhar rolled his eyes at his captain's introduction. I'm Noir, a pirate bounty hunter, Noir replied friendly. A bounty hunter. Ace and his crew shouted in unison. Deuce, trembling, stammered, you're not here to catch us, are you? Skull, familiar with the pirate world, exclaimed in horror, now I remember. He's the notorious pirate hunter Noir, feared throughout the East Blue. Ace, clutching his head in shock, exclaimed, so we boarded a pirate hunter's ship. The usually silent Myhar sighed helplessly at the antics of his crewmates. Noir, unfazed, watched the three pirates retreat and asked mockingly, Do you have bounties on your heads? Bounties. Ace scratched his head and thought. I don't think so, not yet. Then it's settled, Noir said. You're not worth a penny to me right now. Why should I bother to catch you? Better to let them grow until their bounties reach 200 million. If not, selling them privately to Garp would also be a good option. Enjoying his mischievous thoughts, Noir smiled inwardly. Hearing this, Ace relaxed, and the three pirates didn't mind Noir's slight insult. They happily linked arms with him. But if Ace knew Noir's real thoughts, he would definitely punch him in the head. Host has befriended an important character. Reward, 1 gold talent copy card, 10 white talent copy cards, constitution plus 15, and Amaterasu flames, modified version. Noir was happy to get another gold copy card. And Amaterasu flames, weren't those the unquenchable flames from Naruto? He quickly checked the system's description and was stunned. While the basic characteristic remained, burning until the target was completely incinerated, the activation method had changed. No longer dependent on eye contact, the Amaterasu flames had become a physical ability. Noir could summon and control them by consuming a certain amount of stamina. The downside was that these flames couldn't be projected, they could only form on his skin. To burn someone, Noir would have to make physical contact and transfer the flames. In a brutal way, he could turn himself into a human torch and attack enemies or wait for them to attack him and burn them to ashes. He wondered if there was any power in the pirate world that could stand up to Amaterasu. In Naruto, there were many ways to deal with it, but here, perhaps only the armament Haki could defend against it. Noir thought deeply. Although the Amaterasu's long-range ability was almost zero, its defense had increased, and it could cover its martial arts and swordsmanship with the flames, making it a powerful offensive tool. Fortunately, the flames would only burn his chosen targets, sparing his clothes. Otherwise, he'd be fighting naked while burning. Enjoying the power of the Amaterasu flames within him, Noir turned his thoughts to Ace. Once Ace ate the flame fruit, Noir planned to copy his abilities. Combining the fire of the devil fruit with the Amaterasu flames would make him the undisputed king of flames. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 29 Barbaric Terrifying Village A thought crossed Noir's mind and he cast a recognition spell on Ace. Name, Ace. Most evil bloodline, gold quality, containing the genes of Pirate King Roger, inheriting the talent for training in hacky and other martial arts. He will face a life-threatening ordeal once in his lifetime, and most of his relatives will suffer misfortune. However, if he overcomes this ordeal, his overall strength will double in a short period of time and he will have extraordinary luck. Brotherhood Pact, red quality where the three brothers share a high amount of luck. Whenever one of the brothers dies, the luck of the other two increases, and their abilities and strengths are greatly enhanced. Devil Progeny, a purple quality that increases the efficiency of hacky training and halves the time required to train any skill. It also excels at training devil fruits. Noir hesitated when he saw Ace's three talents. Her skills were quite impressive, with one gold, one red, and one purple. However, Noir only had one gold and one red copy card, and Ace's talents were indeed dangerous. The most evil bloodline could potentially grant the genetic talents inherited from Pirate King Roger, but the life-threatening ordeal was terrifying. In the original story, Ace did not survive this ordeal, leading to his tragic death and the downfall of the Whitebeard Pirates. 
understanding the Brotherhood Pact explained why Luffy always seemed to narrowly escape death. Noir decided not to copy Ace's talents, as they would probably be of no use to him. He planned to save the copy cards for when they reached the Grand Line and intended to copy Myhawk's swordsmanship talent. That would be the best choice. Ace stared at Noir with genuine sincerity and said, Noir. Will you join our pirate crew? Noir was taken aback, but smiled and said, No, I don't want to be a pirate right now. Unwilling to give up, Ace asked, Why? Being a pirate is great. You can go on adventures all over the place. Noir shook his head and smiled silently. Ace lowered his head, somewhat discouraged, and said, If you ever change your mind, the spade pirates will always be waiting for you. I think the world of you. Noir felt a little touched and replied, Maybe in the future. Just make sure you don't get defeated and recruited by someone else. Ace confidently thumped his chest, That will never happen. But Noir silently thought to himself, That's very likely. Whitebeard would slap you a few times, call you his son, and you would cry your eyes out right then and there. With Kassa guiding them, the ship quickly found its destination. The thick fog around them began to change color. Ace, standing at the edge of the ship, marveled at the fog, how strange, the fog is turning pale red. Deuce, wearing a black mask, shivered, like a blood fog. Noir frowned, using his supersensory ability, but the deeper they went into the red mist, the weaker the effect of the ability became. In the middle of the red mist, an island of red maple trees appeared before them. The red leaves made the entire island look as if it had been dyed red, and the ground was covered with a carpet of fresh red leaves. Castle looked at the red island and said, This is Red Leaf Island, where our village lives. The leaves of these trees emit a special mist that makes it impossible for most ships to navigate through. The red mist environment created by these leaves is perfect for the red dolphin. Only they know the roots around the island, so we rely on them for guidance. Noir nodded in recognition. The world was full of wonders, and even Nami's extraordinary navigational talents had met their match. Ace, excited, grabbed his hat and said, Let's go ashore. Silent Myhar, holding his gun, approached Noir and asked, Mr. Noir, I'll stay and guard the ship. Observing the usual behavior of Ace and the others, Noir could tell that Myhar often stayed to guard the ship. Trusting Ace's crew, Noir nodded, That's fine. With that, Noir and three others escorted Kassa ashore. As soon as they stepped on the ground, Ace exclaimed, This island is so strange, the ground is covered with soft red leaves. Noir, cautious, used his powers of observation and said, There are many poisonous insects and snakes here. Can humans really live on this island? Cass's eyes showed a hint of contempt. These ignorant outsiders have no idea of the holiness of this island. When the terrifying high priest arrives, you will all be reduced to ashes. Cass's face twisted with a sinister expression. Seeing his expression, Ace couldn't help but react. He punched and kicked Kassa to the ground, leaving him stunned. What did I do to deserve this beating? Bruised and battered, Kassa obediently led the way, eventually bringing them to a primitive-looking village. As they entered, people armed with weapons and wearing strange face paint surrounded them from all sides. Regardless of age or gender, everyone had a fierce look in their eyes, staring at the newcomers as if they were prey. Some children were even drooling at the sight. Ace looked around and suddenly turned pale, patting Noir's shoulder and pointing to a corner of the village, look. Noir looked and his face darkened. It was a row of wooden racks, stained with fresh blood, hanging with bloody flesh, scattered with torn clothes and terrified faces frozen in death. It was obvious what they had eaten. Noir shivered, glaring at the villagers like wild wolves. This island is nothing but a savage, uncivilized place filled with inhuman beasts. Seeing his territory, Kassa regained his arrogance and laughed wildly, You dared to come ashore, now you can't leave. Stay and become our food. Perfect. We'll offer you as a sacrifice to our high priest who taught us the ways of human cooking. The villagers, armed and ready, eyed them hungrily. Surrounded, Ace's expression grew serious. He asked quietly, What now? We can't kill them all, can we? Noir's face hardened, Get the leader first. It's that damn high priest who taught them that. We take him down first. Got it. Kassa, hearing this, laughed maniacally, you think you can defeat our high priest who creates fire. Outsiders like you are only fit to be our. Before he could finish, Kassa felt a sudden chill on his neck. Looking up, the sky seemed to turn blood red, 
and the friendly villagers charged like devils. His consciousness faded. Noir raised his bloodstained sword, glared at the savages, and roared. That damned high priest, come out and face me. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 30, The Unfortunate High Priest Accompanied by Noir's roar, the surrounding villagers seemed to be enraged as well. How dare you insult the high priest? Kill them. Skin them alive. Offer their skins to the high priest. At the mention of the so-called high priest, the villagers became even more ferocious, brandishing their weapons as they charged forward. Ace couldn't hold back any longer and charged in, fists raised. Deuce and Skull also drew their flintlocks and began firing, fighting back. But one figure was moving faster than all of them. Noir, sword at the ready, bent his body and charged into the crowd, reaching the villagers in an instant. As the villagers looked on in horror, Noir grabbed the hilt of his sword and unleashed a mighty slash. The famous rapid draw technique of Hiten Mitsurugai Ryu. Dragon's Nest Flash. The cold words fell, and Noir's blade quickly unsheathed and disappeared into the air. Lights and shadows flickered as Noir unleashed dozens of swift slashes in a matter of seconds. Many enemies didn't even realize where the attacks had landed before mortal wounds appeared on their bodies. Ah! Only as the pain spread did the injured react, instantly collapsing in droves. So, so powerful. Deuce and Skull looked at Noir, who resembled a war god, and stammered in shock. Ace's eyes sparkled with excitement as he exclaimed, Noir is indeed strong. The villagers, intimidated by Noir's display, hesitated to move forward. At that moment, an old voice suddenly rang out. Outsiders! You are courting death! Noir looked toward the voice and saw an old man with a sinister expression, white hair, and a beard approaching. The villagers, overjoyed, made way for the old man, shouting, The High Priest is here! High Priest, punish them! Burn the outsiders to ashes with heavenly fire! Hearing the villagers kiss ass praise, the old man's face showed an arrogant expression. He scornfully addressed Noir and the others, Boy, if you know what's good for you, surrender and become my food. Ace, unable to contain himself, cursed, bullshit, go suck your milk. After cursing, Ace charged forward again. Having been overshadowed by Noir earlier, he was eager for a good fight. The high priest's face turned red from the insult, but he didn't dodge Ace's incoming blow. Instead, his eyes showed a trace of contempt. Indeed, when Ace's fist struck the old man, it felt like a fireball. The high priest's head exploded like fireworks, and Ace's arm went through the flames. So hot, what's going on? Ace pulled his arm back, stunned by the lack of impact and the heat on his hand. Under the worshipful gaze of the villagers, the high priest's head reformed from the flames, revealing a smug old face. He laughed heartily, ha ha ha, boy, do you feel the power of the gods? A twisted freak who ate a devil fruit really thinks he's a god. Noir's calm voice rang out stopping the high priest's laughter. He glared at Noir angrily, as if someone had revealed his secret. Though worshipped as a deity by the Icelanders, the high priest knew that his formidable power came from a fruit he had eaten years ago. He wasn't from the island. Originally a pirate with a terrible taste for human flesh, he was abandoned by his crew and fled to this remote island where he had ruled for years. Noir's words tore away the high priest's years of facade and self-deception. Ace slapped his forehead in realization, a devil fruit? So this guy is like Luffy who ate one of those fruits. The high priest's beard twitched in anger. His hands turned into flames as he shouted, Both of you, shut up. His now fiery arms reached out toward Noir and Ace. However, the speed of the fire pillars was laughable to them. They easily dodged the attacks with light jumps. Ace sneered, Old man, your aim sucks. Noir rolled his eyes at another who was wasting a good devil fruit ability. The high priest, seething with rage, turned his entire lower body into fire and charged at them with blazing speed. Knowing that he couldn't be hit, Ace quickly dodged, allowing the high priest to change direction toward Noir. Seeing Noir distracted, the high priest smiled inwardly. You little brat! Prepare to be burned! To Noir, the high priest's speed was laughable. When the old man finally approached, Noir leisurely raised his leg high above his head. Gotcha! Just as the high priest was about to celebrate, a sharp pain nearly knocked him out. A foot blackened with hacky stomped on the high priest's head, driving him into the ground like a nail. What? The villagers panicked. 
why didn't the high priest's miraculous fire ability work? Ace, impressed and confused, asked, how could you hit that guy? Noir smiled at him, it's called Haki. I'll teach you later. Really? That'd be awesome. As they chatted, a muffled voice came from under Noir's foot, don't get cocky, bastard. I'm not dead yet. The high priest, in a fit of rage, turned into flames and scattered, avoiding Noir's demonic foot. He yelled, you've made me angry, brat. Ace tugged at his ear, he said you made him angry, Noir. Oh. Noir replied casually, well, ain't I great. Fervent followers of the high priest, the villagers looked as if they had swallowed dung, while deuce and skull stifled their laughter. The high priest, driven mad by the disrespect, unleashed his fire abilities. With his hands raised above his head, he channeled fiery streams into his palms, forming a small sun-like fireball. The orange-red glow intensified, and the hot air blasted everyone present. The villagers, seeing the high priest's magnificent fireball, chanted fanatically. The high priest is invincible. The high priest is invincible. The high priest's face turned purple-red as he pushed himself to the limit, but he still flaunted his power, die, you bastards. This is the power of the gods. But under the firelight, Ace showed no fear, and Noir picked his nose boredly. That ability, with all its posing, must be easy to dodge, right? Ace thought. Noir had a simpler thought. This old man took forever to charge up, only to produce a weak imitation of the Great Flame Commandment, Flame Emperor. Chapter 31, The Flame Flame Fruit The High Priest picked up a miniature version of the Flame Emperor and threw it down with a sinister smile, shouting, Die, you bastard! The blazing fireball hovered over the two of them. Ace raised his eyebrows slightly. Hmm. Its speed is actually quite slow. Ace, agile as ever, ran much faster than the fireball, dodging it with a few quick moves. The high priest panted heavily when he saw how fast the boy was moving. He was furious, his eyes almost popping out of his head. Is my skill really that easy to dodge? But when he turned around, he saw the young man standing there with a sword at his waist, seemingly frozen in fear. The high priest's smile returned, but it quickly froze on his face. This scene, looks familiar? The fireball crashed to the ground, causing a massive explosion and a heat wave that shot into the sky. The searing hot stream flowed everywhere. Ace and the others watched from the sidelines with their eyes wide open. Noir, is he okay? The fire lit the red leaves of the island, sending up thick black smoke. The small village was instantly transformed into a sea of fire. A black silhouette slowly emerged from the towering flames. Ace and the others immediately recognized him as Noir. Seeing Noir walk out of the fire unharmed, the high priest was stunned and stammered, Why, do you also have, black fire? Amaterasu's black flames blazed wildly on Noir's body, and with black fire streaks on his face, his features looked even more sinister, like a devilish overlord emerging from hell. Ordinary flames can't possibly compare to my son fire Amaterasu, Noir said, raising his burning arm with satisfaction. Impossible. How can this be? The high priest stared at Noir in disbelief. The terrifying temperature of those black flames made his own flaming body feel the heat. How many years had passed since he last felt hot? Die. This is all a lie. The high priest swung his flaming whip at Noir, who calmly raised his Amaterasu-covered hand, easily dispersing the flames. The orange-red flames seemed to hit their superior. The black Amaterasu flames devoured the ordinary flames like a ravenous beast causing the high priest's flames to scatter as if facing their father. What is happening? The long-revered high priest fell to the ground in horror as he looked at Noir. Noir walked toward the fallen shaman, draped in a black flame cloak, spreading a cloud of black fire with each step. This scene was truly one for the books. Noir placed his hand on the shaman's face. Under the combined grip of armament Haki and the burning Amaterasu, the shaman's body shook violently, emitting a sound like roasting flesh. No. Please spare me. The high priest wailed miserably, but Noir remained unmoved. The black flames gradually engulfed his entire body. The burning pain drove the shaman mad, and he cursed venomously, You will go to hell, you will die a horrible death. Noir looked coldly at the struggling shaman and said, You can take those words to hell with you. With that, Noir drew his pure heart sword and infused it with black flames and haki. He stabbed the shaman, and the flames of Amaterasu erupted from within. No. The shaman's piercing scream echoed across the island until the voice faded. 
the Amaterasu flames had done their work, leaving nothing but ashes. Noir withdrew his hand and looked coldly at the terrified villagers. The villagers were horrified to see their godlike shaman burned alive. Some cowards knelt and begged for mercy. Ace, with a complex expression, walked over to Noir and sighed, they can't be saved. Noir pulled back the flames, feeling a bit dejected. Such a beautiful island, yet it held dangers and horrors greater than the outside world. And these people, was the entire village's perverse habit cultivated by that one shaman? It was only ignorance, hunger and greed that had robbed them of their humanity and turned them into such walking corpses. They could irresponsibly kill anyone who ventured into the mist because the beast within them had lost its restraint. But Noir and Ace couldn't. They couldn't kill everyone on the island to ensure safety, they didn't have that right. Noir didn't think he had the right to pass a death sentence on an entire island, even if he thought they all deserved to die. Maybe Noir still hadn't fully adjusted to this cruel world. I'll find a way to inform the Marine, Noir said, sheathing his sword with a sigh. Ace nodded. It was better to leave them to the Marine than to deal with it as a pirate. Noir glared at the villagers and threatened, If you dare eat people again, you'll end up like that damn shaman. The villagers, pale as ghosts, nodded vigorously. Ace said with a stern face, Get us out of here. The villagers hurriedly fetched several red striped dolphins and tied them to the boat. These local red striped dolphins knew the way. These sea creatures could easily guide Noir and the others out of this place. None of them had any fondness for this place and wanted to leave immediately. Back on the ship, they finally set sail. In the thick fog, Noir looked back in the direction of Red Leaf Island, wondering if his threat had any effect. Maybe the island would become a cannibal island again after they left. The red fog gradually turned white, indicating that they were returning to the familiar sea. The heavy mood of the five began to lighten. I'm starving. Noir, Ace groaned, lying on the deck and clutching his stomach. Noir replied irritably, so many demands, and you're on my ship. The thick-skinned Ace laughed, we travel together for now. Once we find an island to build a ship on, everything will be fine. Noir had mentioned to Ace that he was also going to the Grand Line. This made Ace incredibly happy, as he shamelessly insisted on hitching a ride. Noir took a bag of apples from the cabin and pulled out a bright red apple. He then drew his pure heart sword and began to carefully peel it. After peeling several apples, Noir gave some to everyone to satisfy their hunger. Then, Noir casually pulled another fruit out of the bag. But before he could cut it, Noir noticed that the fruit looked familiar. Its surface had spiral patterns an orange-red color, and the skin was covered with small flame-shaped spiral patterns. This was probably, possibly, the flame-flame fruit. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 32, The Birth of Fire Fist More chapters if we actually reach 400 power stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. Noir stared at the devil fruit in his hand. It was unmistakable. Why had the flaming devil fruit appeared on his ship after the death of the high priest? In the original story, something like this had happened before, when a devil fruit user died, a nearby fruit had a chance to become a new devil fruit. But that was too random. Noir looked strangely at the flame fruit in his hand. Ace curiously looked over and asked, Strange, this fruit looks really strange, doesn't it? Noir threw the flame flame fruit to Ace and said, This is a devil fruit. It should be a Logia-type flame flame fruit. That high priest had that power. Ace clumsily grabbed the fruit and said, A devil fruit, like the weird one Luffy ate when he was a kid. The spiral patterns on the skin were as fascinating as black holes. Ace's eyes were glued to the fruit. So if I eat this, I can turn into fire like that high priest. Noir nodded. You just won't be able to swim anymore. Then Noir added, This power suits you well. Go ahead and eat it. Me? You don't want it. Ace was stunned. Noir held out his hand, and a puff of black flame rose. Ace understood immediately. So Noir had eaten a devil fruit as well. Wait a minute. Then why was he able to swim with me before? Ace couldn't figure out the mechanics of the system, no matter how much he thought about it. Looking into the encouraging eyes of his crewmates, Ace finally nodded and said, All right, I'll give it a try. With that, Ace grabbed the flame flame fruit and took a big bite, revealing the orange flesh underneath the skin. It looked quite good. Noir asked curiously, how does it taste? Ace's expression slowly stiffened. Then his features twisted together, 
his eyelids twitched, and his eyes rolled back. Just looking at his expression, Noir and the others felt their teeth ache. Ace struggled to swallow the meat and said, sticking out his tongue, Ugh. It's horrible. It tastes like burnt poop. Noir couldn't help but laugh at the bizarre comparison. Ace opened his palm, and a wisp of orange-red flame danced on his fingertips. Ace exclaimed in amazement, I really turned into fire. It doesn't burn at all. Let me try. With a sudden leap, Ace's body instantly transformed into roaring flames. Ace absorbed and compressed the flames into his right arm, then formed a massive golden red flaming fist, which he swung toward the sea. A huge, powerful blast of high temperature flames in the shape of a fist shot deep into the sea. Its power penetrated hundreds of meters underwater and continued. Deuce and the others were stunned. So, so powerful. Ace landed back on the deck and played with the flames on his fingertips. This power is so interesting. I'll call this move Fire Fist. Noir watched Ace with admiration. With the flame fruit, Ace was now truly the Fire Fist Ace from the original story. He had not expected to witness the birth of Fire Fist with his own eyes. Young and vigorous, Ace had a monstrous physique, far superior in power to the aging High Priest. That single Fire Fist move was far more powerful than the High Priest's ultimate attack. Noir used the system to scan Ace and found that he had indeed gained two new talents, Devil's Host, Flame Flame and Seize Rejection. The quality of the Flame Fruit talent was red. Quietly approaching the excited Ace, Noir pulled out a red copy card and slammed it down, causing Ace to stumble. Red Quality Flame Flame Fruit Ability Acquired With this move, Noir finally replaced the Genzo Combat Technique from his youth. Zoan Type Bear Fruit and Logia Type Flame Flame Fruit Noir was now a true dual fruit user. In the future, when he copied a gold level fruit from all three types, who could stop him? System Reminder, Host, the Devil's Host ability, is subject to world rules. The same ability can only exist once, unless the host eliminates the original talent owner. Noir snapped out of his joy and asked nervously, what does that mean? The system's cold voice continued. Although the system copies the Devil's Host talent exactly, the training speed is only 50% and the upper limit of the ability is reduced. Killing the original owner allows the host to fully acquire the talent. Now he understood. Noir's face was filled with disbelief. Although he now had the ability of the flaming fruit, his training efficiency would be much lower than Ace's. No wonder his training with the bear fruit had gone smoothly, he'd already killed the original owner, Kembrat. To fully master the ability of the flame fruit, he'd have to kill Ace. Noir quickly dismissed the thought. Not only had they formed a bond, but Garp would kill him if he ever found out. No matter, he'd just find someone else to kill in the future. Noir quickly adjusted his attitude as Ace and the others continued their celebration, finally feeling tired. Noir, I'm so hungry. Isn't there any food left on the ship? Ace cried, bored and lying on the ground. Noir looked at him from his deck chair and said, No, can't you cook for yourself? We still have ingredients. Ace replied dejectedly, I can't cook. My pirate crew doesn't have a cook yet. Deuce and the others cooking is terrible. The three crew members glared at him simultaneously. If our cooking is so bad, why do you eat it? Your cooking would probably taste like devil fruit. Noir comforted them, just hold on a little longer. Once we get out of this fog, the route will return to normal and we'll soon reach my destination. Ace asked curiously, where are you going? Noir smiled and said, the restaurant Baratai. Baratai. Skull exclaimed in surprise. I've heard so much about Baratai. I didn't expect to eat there. Ace looked at Noir expectantly and asked, is the food there good? It's better than what you make. Noir said, feeling excited inside. Besides tasting delicious food, he had another goal in Baratai. The curly-browed cook, Sanji. He'd met Zoro and gotten flying swordsmanship then met Ace and got Amaterasu Flame. What would he get from meeting Sanji? It should be something to do with cooking or recipes, right? P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 33, The Food Devourers More chapters if we actually reach 400 power stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. On a calm sea, a large ship sailed steadily along its course. Noir stood at the bow with a map in his hand, excitedly gazing out at the distant sea. We've arrived. Ace and the others rushed to the bow, 
their faces full of wonder as they gazed upon the uniquely designed floating restaurant. Although it was called a restaurant, it had the appearance of a huge ship, with fish-shaped figureheads at each end. The ship was quite spacious, obviously able to accommodate many diners. Ace cheered, let's go. Time to disembark and eat. The ship docked at Baratai, and Ace eagerly led everyone ashore. Noir turned to the cool and aloof sharpshooter, Myhar, and asked, aren't you coming ashore to eat? Myhar shook his head and replied in a deep voice, just have the captain bring me something. Noir shrugged and then caught up with Ace, who ran ahead. The four of them pushed open the door and entered the restaurant. From the outside, Baratai looked extravagant, but inside it looked like a high-end restaurant. Clean. That was Noir's first impression upon entering. Hygiene is a basic requirement for any restaurant, and Baratai certainly met that standard. Noir, Ace, Deuce, and Skull, Myhar found a table and sat down. Soon a neatly dressed waiter approached with menus in hand and a smile on his face. What would you like to eat, gentlemen? Ace picked up a menu and started to look at it, but when he saw the prices, the three of them simultaneously turned their eyes to Noir. Since they had no choice, since their ship had sunk and all their money was gone with it, they relied on Noir, who had become the big spender. Noticing their eager gazes, Noir generously said, Order whatever you want. I've got money. With the financier's approval, Ace's restraint was unleashed. With a swagger, he tossed the menu aside and said, One of everything. The waiter looked at them as if they were crazy. But his tone quickly turned cold as he said, I'm sorry, but even though we are a restaurant, we don't welcome such waste. Noir was also taken aback and asked, Can you really eat all that? For the first time, Ace showed an emperor like aura, and even Deuce and Skull adopted a masterful demeanor. When it came to eating, Ace's expression changed from his usual nonchalance to one of seriousness. The change in their demeanor was as dramatic as a certain bald teacher going into serious mode. With one hand on his chin and a sharp stare, Deuce said, Noir, you got to understand, when it comes to food, we are unbeatable. Ace slapped the table and confidently told the waiter, Don't worry, we'll eat everything, not a crumb left. With this assurance, the waiter, despite his disbelief, had no choice but to comply. Soon a sumptuous feast was brought out by the waiters and quickly filled the table. What followed left everyone in the restaurant gasping in amazement. Ace and the others devoured the food like starved ghosts, not even bothering with utensils, just shoveling the food directly into their mouths along with the plates. Then spitting the plates out. Noir felt out of place eating with a fork, given the bizarre scene in front of him. With his mouth full of meat, Ace muttered, Noir, hurry up, you'll miss out if you don't eat fast. What are you saying? Noir asked, a vein popping out of his forehead. As the food ran out, the trio didn't slow down, but became even more ravenous. Even the food in front of Noir was snatched by a sinful hand. No way. Noir barely had enough to satisfy his appetite. Back then, he was the undefeated food champion of his school, earning the nickname Food Emperor and the bane of the school cafeteria. How could he lose to those guys? Dropping all pretense of elegance, Noir stood up put one foot on the table, and entered the fray, battling Ace for the food. The food devourers made their official debut as the restaurant's patrons looked on in pity. Look how hungry these kids are. Even the waiter was ashamed of his earlier judgment. Seeing these obviously malnourished individuals, his previous comments seemed completely inappropriate. The commotion caused by the four was no small matter, and the kitchen was essentially at war. A waiter, drenched in sweat, burst into the kitchen and shouted, these customers have ordered another full menu. What? You've got to be kidding. They already ate enough for 20 people. Damn it. My chef's pride is on fire. No way will I lose to them. Several burly chefs in hats and uniforms dashed around the kitchen, quickly preparing an array of exquisite dishes. Despite their frantic pace, they were all exhausted and drenched in sweat, but they still couldn't keep up with the speed at which the food was being consumed outside. For a restaurant, not being able to serve food fast enough for customers was a great embarrassment. Especially when the entire kitchen crew was on the job and still couldn't keep up with just one table. The cooks swore that those four ate more than all the other customers combined in a day. Amidst the chaos, a young, sharply dressed man with a distinctive eyebrow appeared in the kitchen. His eye was partially covered by blonde hair, while his visible eyebrow formed a distinct swirl that seemed hypnotic if stared at for too long. Sanji, Baratai's young sous-chef, stood in the chaotic kitchen with authority and commanded, calm down. 
everyone immediately fell silent. With a serious expression on his face, Sanji ordered, assign two more cooks to take care of these guys' meals. I'll go outside and check the situation. Sanji went out and quickly located the conspicuous group of four. At their table the fight for food raged on. Deuce and Skull were almost wrestling, while Noir and Ace had flames shooting out of their hands. Sanji approached, his mouth twitching at the sight. As someone who valued dining etiquette, he didn't particularly appreciate the group's table manners. However, Sanji was also magnanimous and would not impose his standards on others. Anyone who was hungry and came to this restaurant was his guest. But this level of eating frenzy was something Sanji had never seen before. Sanji looked at the four and asked with a touch of grace, Are you enjoying your meal? Noir immediately recognized Sanji's distinctive eyebrows. Waving his steak, Noir replied contentedly, Not bad, but you're serving a little slow. We're just getting started. Sanji's eye twitched. Just getting started? If they really started, the heads of the kitchen staff would be on the chopping block. P.S. Consider reviewing and dropping some power stones. I would be very grateful and motivated. Chapter 34, The Pervy Chef, Sanji More chapters if we actually reach 400 power stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. When he heard Noir's words, Sanji was quite surprised. According to the law of conservation of energy in the world of One Piece, a person's strength could be measured to some extent by how much they ate. Noir and Ace had absurdly strong physiques, and even Skull and Deuce were far beyond normal humans. So it wasn't embarrassing to eat a lot. But Sanji wasn't aware of that. He just felt that this group was incredibly formidable. It was an important challenge in his career. Noir wiped his mouth and activated the system to check Sanji's talents. Name, Sanji. Master Chef, Red Talent. His love and talent for cooking makes him more focused and efficient in learning culinary skills. The food he prepares is more delicious and enticing. Black Leg Chef, Red Talent. As an excellent chef, he never dirties his cooking hands. As a result, his lower body undergoes rigorous training, allowing him to incorporate cooking techniques into his fighting style, making his kicks far more powerful than average. Friend of Women, Purple Talent. Obsessed with women. When his teammates are female and the enemy is of the opposite sex, his combat power can increase based on the woman's charm, potentially multiplying many times over. If the enemy is female and the teammates are also female, Sanji's combat power will decrease based on the woman's charm, possibly going negative. If the enemy is female and the teammates are also female, his combat power decreases based on both the enemy's and the teammates' charm, potentially dropping to zero. Impressive. Noir felt that he had learned something new today. It was the first time he had seen such a detailed talent description. Although it was long, considering Sanji's flirtatious nature, the meaning was quite clear, consisting of three scenarios. If Sanji's teammate was a woman, like Nami, and the enemy was Zoro, Sanji could get a boost and possibly defeat Zoro instantly. But if his teammate was Zoro and the enemy was Nami, Sanji's battle power would likely drop to negative, causing him to mistakenly attack Zoro. And if his teammate was Nami and the opponent was Robin, it would be as if Sanji wasn't even there. Nami and Robin might be unharmed, but Sanji would inexplicably collapse. No wonder he was the famously flirtatious cook, Sanji. His presence could greatly affect the outcome of a battle. Ding, you have met Sanji. Rewards have been distributed, Red Talent Copy Card 1, White Copy Card 10, Master Cooking Skill 1, Constitution Plus 10. When Noir heard the system's cold voice, he smiled in surprise. A reward related to Sanji would naturally be linked to his identity as a cook. In an instant, it felt as if an enormous amount of knowledge had been poured into Noir's mind, as if his hands had been wielding a kitchen knife for many years. Even the food he had just praised seemed mediocre. It was as if a voice was echoing in his head, I could do better. The flavor quality dropped significantly, the presentation of the food became noticeably sloppy, and some dishes even made Noir want to curse. Frowning, Noir said, May I see your kitchen? Sanji's eyebrow twitched and he replied, Sorry, sir. Only chefs are allowed in our kitchen. Do you have a problem with our food? Noir nodded and pointed to the food on the table, The ingredients and techniques used in these dishes are getting worse and worse. I just want to see how you prepare them. Sanji, though slightly annoyed by Noir's blunt criticism, remained calm. Even though the kitchen was working under a tight deadline, every dish served to the customers was to the chef's satisfaction. 
Sanji had faith in the standards and precision of his restaurant's cooks. Otherwise, Baratai wouldn't have gained such a reputation in the East Blue. Besides, you ate like it was a gang fight and now you have the nerve to say that the food isn't good? Sanji was annoyed and Noir felt a little embarrassed. But what could he do? Who would have thought that eating would suddenly make him a master chef? Noir quickly explained, I can cook, too. If you don't mind, may I use your kitchen to prepare a meal for myself? You can cook. Sanji's expression softened slightly, but he still refused, our restaurant cooks for our guests. We don't let customers cook for themselves. Seeing Sanji's firm stance, Noir was about to give up when a deep, elderly voice spoke up. Let him, Sanji. Noir looked over to see an old man in a chef's outfit with an extraordinarily large chef's hat approaching. The old man had a golden mustache twisted into plates that extended rigidly to either side, and his wooden peg leg clacked against the floor as he walked. With an ever stern expression, he blew his mustache and glared at Sanji, if the customer is dissatisfied with our food and wants to cook for himself, let him. It is our responsibility as chefs not to meet the customer's taste. Old geezer. But. Sanji tried to argue, but the old man waved him off. He approached Noir with a fierce look, but if we find out you're messing with us. Noir listened to the old man's threat calmly, unfazed. This old man was most likely Red Foot Zef. Having sailed the Grand Line for a year and returned, his strength was indeed impressive. But he didn't scare Noir. Noir elegantly wiped his hands and mouth and headed for the kitchen, Zef following close behind. Sanji scratched his head and muttered in frustration, what a mess. Meanwhile, the food devourers continued their front-line battle, showing no signs of stopping. Entering the kitchen, Noir saw the busy cooks and Zef scowled, stroking his stiff mustache. The cooks noticed Zef bringing in a stranger and curiously asked, Chef, who is this? A new hire. Zef shook his head, he's a guest from this table. Dissatisfied with your cooking, he wants to make his own. What? The cooks were outraged. Even though they were in a hurry, they never compromised on quality. And now this guy was saying that their food wasn't good enough? And he wanted to cook himself? That was an insult to any cook. They glared at Noir, and some of the more intimidating ones even rolled up their sleeves, ready to teach him a lesson. But Zef's loud shout stopped them, and he stepped aside, pointing to the cooking station, go ahead. Ignoring the hostile looks, Noir picked up a knife, his casual demeanor suddenly becoming sharp. Serious mode activated. Grabbing a fresh fish, his knife moved with lightning speed, making the fish's flesh bloom like a flower. The white bones were quickly and cleanly pulled out, leaving not a single piece of flesh behind. This single move instantly changed the cook's expressions. Sanji watched Noir's actions in amazement, secretly praising, what a skillful technique. Chapter 35, Shock Sanji More chapters if we actually reach 400 power stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. Removing the fish's scales, guts, and bones, Noir's movements were quick, clean, and mesmerizing. With a quick chop, a row of green onions and garlic fell into the pan, followed by a burst of flame as he added the sauce and sake, then placed the fish slices in. As Noir's routine unfolded, the previously angry cooks began to calm down. The further he went, the more amazed they became. In terms of knife skills, cooking techniques, and precision, this person seemed like a seasoned chef who had spent many years in the kitchen. The aroma gradually filled the kitchen, causing everyone to sniff the air, their faces showing an expression of longing. Even before the dish was served, they could tell from the smell alone that this person's cooking skills far surpassed their own. Sanji, smelling the aroma, looked a bit dazed, while Zef's old face broke into a smile. A swordsman with such excellent culinary skills was truly impressive. For Zef and Sanji, their hands were precious tools for cooking, never to be damaged or tainted by battle. Noir's high level of culinary skill left them both amazed and impressed. Sanji's initially indifferent expression became serious. After a while, Noir's dish was ready. He scooped it out and took a small bite, feeling a rush of happiness. This was the taste. The slices of fish were fresh and tender, melting in his mouth, rich but not greasy, completely different from what he had eaten before. Sanji hesitantly stepped forward and asked, Can I try some? Noir, in the midst of devouring his meal, generously pushed the plate toward him and said, Eat. Don't be polite. Excuse me. Sanji bent down and gently tasted the fish soup with a spoon. 
Noir's method of cooking was different from the norm of this world. He used techniques from the Chinese cuisine of his former life, while in the pirate world most dishes were Japanese or Western. Sanji was initially confused by Noir's dish, but was quickly overwhelmed by its taste. The cooking techniques were slightly different from the restaurant's chefs, but why was the taste so much better? After just one bite, Sanji put down his utensils and sighed, the guest is indeed remarkable. His expression was complex. Sanji had thought that having studied cooking from a young age and having been meticulously trained by Chef Zef, his culinary skills were second to none. But today, Noir's presence had given him a humbling reality check. At 17, Sanji was at an age where he thought he was invincible, but this incident had tempered his arrogance. Zef, seeing this, felt deeply satisfied. Sanji was his nominal student, but in reality, he had long been cared for as a son. With his extraordinary talent in cooking, Sanji was expected to surpass him in a few years. Today's beating was a good lesson to humble him. After finishing his meal, Noir let out a satisfied burp and said, Thanks for the food. The cooks, a little ashamed, lowered their heads. Zef stepped forward and said, No, we should apologize for not taking good care of our guest. Noir casually waved him off. Just then, a shout came from the kitchen door, Mr. Noir, our ship is being attacked. It was Skull's voice. Noir's expression turned serious and he quickly ran out. Sanji and Zef exchanged glances and followed. Noir rushed outside and looked out to sea, where a ship flying a pirate flag was headed straight for his. Several pirates had already boarded his ship, making Noir furious. All my money is on that ship. Just as Noir was about to attack, a hand stopped him. It was Ace, his mouth still full of food. Swallowing, Ace said, Don't worry, my heart is on the ship. My har? Noir was stunned, that aloof sniper? As Ace said, as soon as the pirates set foot on the ship, they were hit in the forehead by bullets almost instantly. It seemed that the bullets of death found their mark without any need for aiming. The pirates couldn't find the source of the bullets and mysteriously fell in large numbers. Noir gasped in astonishment. This usually silent guy had such incredible marksmanship? Ace proudly said, My har has unparalleled sniper skills capable of hitting any enemy no matter how well they hide or how far away they are. This level of sniping probably touched observation hacky. Noir was secretly amazed. To be part of Ace's crew, one had to be exceptional. Then Ace started to stretch and said fiercely, Leave it to me, I'll sink this pirate ship. Noir stopped him with a raised hand. Seeing Ace's confused look, Noir smiled and said, I'll handle this. I want to try a new skill. Ace tilted his head, New skill? Noir jumped into the air and suddenly orange flames erupted from his body. Ace's eyes widened. Isn't that my devil fruit ability? Imitating Ace's movements, Noir unleashed a torrent of flames that turned half the sky crimson, then gathered the flames into his arm. As the flames compressed, his arm glowed golden. Swinging his fist at the pirate ship, Noir mimicked Ace's tone and shouted, Hiken! Even the imitation version of the fire fist had tremendous power. The fiery fist hit the pirate ship with a massive explosion, shattering it instantly and leaving the pirates dead or injured, the ship's fragments still burning. A fire fist to destroy a ship, not bad, very powerful. Noir was satisfied and withdrew his fist, completely ignoring Ace's confused and envious expression. Ace, unable to contain his curiosity, asked, Noir. How can you use my skill? Noir simply replied, I copied yours. Ace was stunned. Copying Devil Fruit's abilities? Realizing quickly, Ace exclaimed, You can copy Devil Fruit abilities? What power is that? Have you eaten a Devil Fruit too? A copying fruit? Shugoi, this fruit is incredible. Seeing Ace's overthinking, Noir was naturally confused. What? Ah, hmm, yes, you're right. While Noir and Ace were joking around, they hadn't noticed the look of uncontrollable fear and shock on the faces of Zef and Sanji behind them. Even Zef, who had ventured into the Grand Line, was shaken and said, Is that guy a monster? Sanji, seeing a large ship being destroyed right before his eyes, felt a wave of uncontrollable fear. Who in the world is this guy? Chapter 36, Heading to Logue Town More chapters if we actually reach 600 Power Stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. The remains of a pirate ship were burning furiously as Noir and Ace stood at the entrance of the Baratai restaurant. The noise from the fire fist had alarmed the chefs inside, 
who all rushed out. Several rowdy chefs with rolling pins and sticks came out aggressively, ready for a brawl. The Baratai restaurant was built on the sea, and countless pirates coveted it every month, so these chefs were no strangers to fighting. But as soon as they stepped outside, they were stunned. Sanji and Zef were shivering in a corner, while Ace and Noir were excitedly saying something like Am I awesome? You're super awesome. More importantly, a thick column of smoke rose in the distance, with pieces of ships floating on the water. Was the battle over? Shouldn't pirates these days at least laugh a few times out of respect, make a threat, and exchange a few harsh words before drawing their swords for a fight? You're not following protocol. Satisfied, Ace patted his stomach and said to Noir, I'm full. Shall we go? Noir nodded and said goodbye to Zef and the others, Thank you, chef. We're leaving. Sanji, coming out of the shock of the fire fist, asked quickly, Leaving? Are you pirates? Ace replied with a proud smile, Of course. We are. You are pirates, Noir interrupted Ace, I am a bounty hunter who captures pirates. The cook's expression suddenly became strange. A bounty hunter on the same ship as pirates? Is this some kind of game? Ace didn't mind Noir's words and bowed happily to the cooks, and then Noir tossed them a whole bag of berries, the payment for the meal. Noir spoke meaningfully to Sanji, My name is Noir, and this is Ace. Perhaps we will meet again sometime. Noir and Ace jumped aboard their ship, hoisted the anchor, and set sail again, leaving the cooks in a daze. These were definitely the most unusual guests they had ever served. They ate like a bunch of animals, but one of them had incredible culinary skills. They were also formidable fighters. Sanji, holding the bag of berries, looked at the departing ship with a complex expression and murmured, Are they heading for the Grand Line as well? Zef stroked his beard and said, With such strength, they should be rare even on the Grand Line. Hearing this, Sanji couldn't help but clench his fists and silently resolve to become stronger. Sanji, you must strive to become stronger. The lifelong dream he shared with the old man, the wondrous all blue sea, might be on the Grand Line. Back on the ship, Noir picked up the map again and thought about the next part of their journey. Ace, energized after his meal, pointed to the vast sea ahead and shouted, Set sail. To the Grand Line. Watching the enthusiastic Ace, Noir couldn't help but pour cold water on him, before we enter the Grand Line, we must first go to Logue Town. Logue Town? Hearing the name of this city, Ace's smile slowly faded. At the mention of Logue Town, he thought of the name he had loathed since childhood, G.O.L.D. Roger, his biological father. The birthplace and death place of the Pirate King Roger, known as the City of Beginning and End. Ace, a bit grumpy, asked, why do we have to go there? Understanding his feelings, Noir explained, to get you a new ship, of course. Do you expect me to go with you all the time? Ace, pouting, muttered quietly, not that I would mind. Noir gave him a look and said, there's actually something more important. We need to find a log pose. A log pose? Ace asked, confused. A navigational compass? Don't we already have one? Noir shook his head and was about to explain when Myhar, who had been silent, suddenly spoke up, I've heard of it. I've heard that the Grand Line has complex and ever-changing weather, making it difficult to determine direction. Ordinary compasses are useless. Only special log poses can guide the way. Surprised, Noir looked at Myhar, who had spoken at length. He was right. In the original story, Luffy's crew had recklessly entered the Grand Line without even a log pose. Noir didn't want to make the same mistake. Stretching out comfortably, Noir said, Logue Town, being the gateway from East Blue to the Grand Line, should have both ships and log poses. Considering the importance of the Grand Line adventure, Ace had no choice but to agree with Noir's plan. Logue Town. People walked the streets with smiles on their faces, merchants shouted and citizens haggled, creating a lively atmosphere. In the shadows, some individuals, their faces well hidden, moved cautiously. Marine patrols could often be seen in the streets, moving in orderly groups. It wasn't long before the Navy would drag out pirates hiding in the darkness, those who had secretly come ashore. The townspeople lived in harmony and the pirates behaved themselves under the watchful eye of the marine, fearing detection and capture. Compared to other islands and towns in East Blue, Logtown's security was much better. Residents knew it was all thanks to the local marine captain stationed here a few years ago, known as Smoker the White Hunter. Like a guillotine, Smoker guarded the entrance to Logtown, 
greatly reducing the number of pirates who dared to enter the Grand Line. At the Marine base, the door to a smoky office was opened by a Marine soldier who saluted, looked at his superior with admiration, and said, Captain Smoker, the new batch of pirate bounties from East Blue has been issued. Smoker, two cigars in his mouth, looked down with a calm voice, got it. Casually flipping through the bounty posters, the soldier continued, the East Blue branch mentioned a pirate named Ace who hasn't been defeated since he set sail, but his crew is only four, so there's no bounty on him yet. Smoker raised an eyebrow and said, Ace? A pirate crew of four is nothing special. The soldier hesitated and said, but, it seems that the one known as the strongest pirate hunter in East Blue, Noir, has also joined his crew. Smoker sneered, A pirate hunter? Just a bunch of desperate dogs chasing after bounties. The so-called strongest in East Blue. Humph. As long as I'm in Logue Town, no pirate will leave here unscathed. Chapter 37, Noir's Good Deeds. More chapters if we actually reach 600 Power Stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. Hula. Noir exclaimed happily as he pushed the pile of tiles in front of him. Ace, Skull, and Myhar immediately showed expressions of frustration upon hearing this. Deuce, who was sitting nearby and itching to play, pushed Ace and said, Move aside, it's my turn. Ace angrily pounded the table and shouted, This isn't normal. Why can't I win just once? Noir, grinning, teased, Blame your bad luck. Ace, unable to tolerate the comment, burst into flames, ready to challenge Noir to an offline duel. The days at sea were boring. One day, out of boredom, Noir had taken the trouble to create the popular game from his former life, Shogi. Its entertainment value was surprisingly high. Everyone except the single-minded Ace played Shogi quite smoothly. As Noir and Ace bickered, time passed quickly and they finally reached their destination, Logue Town. Still socially anxious, Myhar stayed behind to guard the ship while Noir and the other three disembarked. After landing, Noir tossed a large bag to Ace and said, We'll split up. You pick a ship you like, and I'll go to the black market to buy the log pose. Ace took the bag, opened it, and saw that it was filled with berries. He said gratefully, Thanks, Noir. Noir waved him off. After being a pirate hunter for so many years, he had saved up quite a bit of money. But ever since he had met Ace, treated him to meals, and financed the purchase of his ship, the money had flowed out like water, and his wallet had gotten lighter and lighter. Looks like he'll have to take on a few more jobs once they enter the Grand Line. Ace, Deuce and Skull went to the shipyard on the island, while Noir went to Logue Town. The streets were peaceful, and the townspeople all had smiles on their faces, showing that they lived well from day to day. Noir enjoyed the atmosphere, strolling lazily down the street and soaking up the warmth of the people of Logue Town. Speaking of which, it wasn't surprising that Logue Town was such a peaceful scene. As the birthplace of Pirate King Roger, the Marine consciously or unconsciously kept an eye on this place. Moreover, the Marine's leader here was known as Smoker the White Hunter, a newcomer to the village. In Noir's understanding, placing Smoker in East Blue meant having a solid gatekeeper for the region. As a Logia-type Devil Fruit user, Smoker's abilities were unstoppable to East Blue pirates who hadn't even heard of Haki. Although the Smoke Devil Fruit's powers were relatively weak compared to other Logia types, dealing with ordinary pirates was a breeze. Unfortunately, Noir's current identity as a legal pirate hunter meant that Smoker wouldn't come after him. Noir had been looking forward to a little sparring with Smoker. Turning into a less crowded street, Noir found vendors selling some unusual navigational tools. He weaved his way through the area and quickly found a heavily cloaked merchant. A black cloth was spread out in front of him, displaying several strange items. Noir's sharp eyes immediately spotted the item he needed. Two spherical blue glass compasses, still attached to their bracelets, were definitely the log poses he needed. Crouching down, Noir pointed at the log poses and asked, How much for these two? The merchant, wearing a hood, had a weathered face that looked beaten down by life. He looked at Noir and said, Five thousand berries each. Not too expensive. Without blinking, Noir pulled ten thousand berries out of his pocket and handed them to the merchant. The merchant took the money, looked at him deeply, and asked, You're going to the Grand Line. Noir was surprised but nodded. Fear filled the merchant's eyes as he said, that place is a graveyard for sailors. You shouldn't go. Looks like he's been to the Grand Line. Judging by his demeanor, he's been severely disillusioned by reality. Noir smiled slightly, 
wagged his finger, and said, only for the weak. The merchant, angered by this, snorted and turned away, ignoring him. Noir didn't mind. His task done, he decided to look around. Ah, the Pirate King's execution platform. Noir left the street and, after asking for directions, soon found his way. This place was a historical site. The strongest pirate in the world, who had sailed around the globe, had been publicly executed here. It was also the official beginning of a dark, yet infinitely promising great pirate era. Following the directions of the townspeople, Noir found the execution platform. Unlike Luffy, he didn't climb up to feel it, he just stood below it and looked at it from the perspective of a spectator. Even from this angle, he could feel the shock of the Pirate King's execution. Speaking of which, the spectators of the Pirate King's execution all became strong individuals. This fact proves that watching great events not only brings joy, but also makes one stronger. While Noir was lost in thought, there was a commotion nearby. Using his observation hacky, he spotted a group of pirates chasing several other pirates, with the lead pirate holding a crying child. Hmm? Noir could not stand by. As a young man of the new era, how could he tolerate evil happening right in front of his eyes? Of course, while doing a good deed, catching a few pirates for money wouldn't be bad either. With his sights set on his prey, Noir sprinted away. With his superhuman jumping ability and speed, Noir leapt onto the rooftops, ran ahead of the pirates, and then jumped down in front of them. Among the marines behind him, a sweet-looking girl with glasses was leading the team. The fearful Tashiji glared at the pirates. How dare they kidnap a child in broad daylight? Do they think the marines don't exist in Logue Town? Tashiji gathered her courage and ran after them, but before she could catch up, someone suddenly blocked the pirates. Thinking it was a kind-hearted citizen, Tashiji shouted, Get out of the way, they have weapons. Before she could finish, under Tashiji's watchful eyes, the person blocking the pirates swung his sword lightly. A bloody, ugly head flew at her. Tashiji screamed and stepped back, looking at the pirate's severed head in horror. Noir approached, holding the child the pirates had taken. With a slight hum, his sword was sheathed. Smiling at the stunned Tashiji, Noir said, Miss Marine, I'll take the bounty on these pirates. M, cash or credit card. Chapter 39, Chapter 38, Flame vs. Smoke. More chapters if we actually reach 600 power stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. Tashiji snapped out of it and stared at the man in front of her. Clutching her sword, she asked cautiously, Who are you? The marines behind her also watched Noir warily. Undeterred, Noir chuckled and said, I am a cold-blooded assassin. Tashiji drew her famous sword, Shijer, and the soldiers aimed their rifles at Noir. Noir twitched the corner of his mouth and said, All right, actually, I'm just an ordinary pirate hunter. You're not going to back out of the deal, are you? Hearing this, Tashiji relaxed a bit and said seriously, Of course, the marine won't owe you any money. By the way, what's your name? I'm Noir. At these words, Tashiji tightened her grip on her sword again, and the soldiers cocked their guns ready to fire. Noir quickly waved his hands and shouted, Wait a minute. What's the meaning of this? With a piercing look, Tashiji said coldly, Pirate Hunter Noir, didn't you join Ace's pirate crew? With a blank face, Noir firmly denied, No, I haven't. How could I join pirates? Ace? What a stupid name. Is it delicious? Far away at the island's harbor, Ace, who was choosing a pirate ship, suddenly sneezed several times in a row. Rubbing his nose, Ace grumbled, Damn it. Luffy must be cursing me behind my back again. Seeing Noir's innocent and confused expression, Tashiji was a bit unsure. She hesitated and said, This is Captain Smoker's order. You must come with us now. Noir shrugged indifferently and said, Let's go. I haven't been paid yet. Tashiji sheathed her sword, and the soldiers lowered their weapons, though Tashiji still gripped his arm tightly to prevent him from escaping. Hmm. Tashiji wanted to grab his shoulder, but the guy was too big. From a distance, they didn't look like a soldier arresting a criminal, but rather like a mafia boss strolling with his little wife. Noir walked ahead with his hands in his pockets, while Tashiji followed close behind, looking serious and demure. The townspeople watched the odd couple with curiosity and whispered. Is Ma'am Tashiji in love? My crush. My heart is broken. 
That guy's really good looking, isn't he? Although they spoke softly, Noir heard them clearly with his advanced observation hacky. Noir said helplessly, can we keep some distance? This looks too ambiguous. Tashiji glared at him and said, we haven't confirmed if you're a criminal yet. I can't let go. Fine. That girl is so stubborn, isn't she? The host has met an important character. Rewards will be issued, one pair of color-changing flashy sunglasses and ten white talent copy cards. Hey? Hearing the familiar system prompt, Noir raised an eyebrow in surprise. Getting caught counts as meeting someone? What are these color-changing flashy sunglasses? The name sounds cool though. Noir eagerly looked at the sunglasses in the system room, while deeply questioning the usefulness of the white copy cards the system gave him. What good is a white talent copy card? Considering Noir's current strength, white talents were of no use to him. Sensing Noir's dissatisfaction, the system was silent for a long time before speaking again, system functions detected insufficient for host. Commencing upgrade. System upgrade will take 72 hours. During this time, the copy function will be unavailable. What? I complained enough that the system is upgrading? Noir was overjoyed. The system had been a great help in making him stronger. An upgrade should provide more services, right? Only three days? No problem. The news of the system upgrade put Noir in a good mood, even making the girl with glasses next to him look prettier. While Noir was successfully arrested by the Marine, Ace ran into some trouble. Everything had gone smoothly. Ace and his two companions had chosen a ready-built ship, even paid for it, and only needed to change its appearance a bit before setting sail. But Ace, being Ace, insisted on eating before the ship was ready, and as a result, Ace's bounty poster had just been distributed by the Navy. A bounty of 40 million berries, and the information on it was from before Ace had eaten the flame fruit. Who knows what Ace had done before that? The moment Ace entered the city and walked into a restaurant, he was recognized and a large contingent of Marines came after him. With a swarm of Marines chasing them, Deuce yelled in frustration, why did Ace's bounty poster have to come out now? Dodging the barrage of bullets behind him, Skull yelled, the Marines have too much firepower. With bullet holes sometimes appearing through the flames on his body, Ace said cheerfully, I think it's okay. That's because they can't hit you. Deuce and Skull shouted angrily at the carefree Ace. As the three fled, they suddenly saw a man on a flashy, smoking motorcycle blocking their way. The man raised a strange-looking weapon and charged straight at Ace. Ace watched the man attack him and remained indifferent. After all, his Logia ability made him immune to physical attacks. But to Ace's astonishment, the Marine's weapon didn't penetrate his body as expected. The Juddies slammed into Ace's chest, shaking his internal organs. Blood rushed to his mouth, but Ace forced it back down. Wiping his mouth, Ace clutched his chest, the smile fading from his face, and stared coldly at the cigar-chomping man before him. The smoker, exhaling white smoke, looked at Ace with disdain and said, Pirate Ace, so you ate a Logia devil fruit, too. But it doesn't matter. No pirate from the East Blue can get past me. High temperature flames erupted from Ace's body, a sunny smile on his face, but his eyes were like those of a predator. Is that so? But I'm going through. The flames intensified, and Ace's body seemed to explode with fiery power, the flames attacking like the fangs of a demon. Smoker snorted coldly, his body shrouded in white smoke, surging forward to meet the flames. For a moment, smoke and fire intertwined, like two ferocious beasts tearing at each other. The elemental storm of fire and smoke grew larger, reaching the sky, visible to everyone in the city. Noir, who had been teasing Tashiji, saw the spectacular scene and suddenly remembered that Ace and Smoker had fought in the original story. But wasn't that supposed to happen three years later? Did I time travel again? Chapter 40, Chapter 39, The Pirate Hunter Returns More chapters if we actually reach 600 Power Stones today. I will drop three extra chapters. Don't forget to review. The battle between the flames and the smoke intensified. Tashiji smacked her forehead anxiously and said, Captain Smoker is fighting a powerful enemy. With that, the bespectacled girl waved her arm at the soldiers and ordered, Hurry over there. Support the captain. Yes. The marines rushed off, and Tashiji followed. After a few steps, she suddenly remembered something and turned back to grab Noir. Noir was touched by Tashiji's devotion, but did she really think she could control him like that? With a slight twist, 
Noir easily escaped Tashiji's grasp, darted onto the roof and disappeared into the distance. A faint voice drifted back, I'll check the situation first. You hurry and catch up. Tashiji stamped her foot in frustration and yelled, hurry up. Noir moved quickly and soon found the battlefield where Ace and Smoker were fighting. At that moment, the two had just separated from their intertwined elements, Smoker shrouded in smoke and Ace with his flaming fist raised. Smoker's eyes flicked over and immediately spotted the approaching Noir. He said, East Blue Hunter Noir, are you here to help the pirate Ace? Ace shouted excitedly, Noir. We bought the ship. We can set sail. Noir covered his forehead in annoyance. Dude, I'm a hunter. Yelling like that just proves that I'm with you guys. Sure enough, Smoker, hearing Ace's words, stared solemnly at Noir and said, So you joined the pirates. Noir spread his hands and tried to explain, Actually, I'm not. Noir tried to explain, but Smoker wouldn't listen. His lower body turned to smoke, propelling him forward. White blow. Smoker raised his jetty, which had a sea stone tip, and swung it down hard at Noir's head. The world is so beautiful, and yet you're so irritable. Noir helplessly raised his sword to block the attack, used both arms to deflect the jetty, and then twisted his body back to slash down. Tornado flash. The rotational force of his body combined with the strength of his arms, channeled into his sword, aimed straight at Smoker's exposed chest. Like Ace, Smoker believed that a mere pirate hunter couldn't hurt him. Smoker didn't defend, he continued his attack. But what he didn't know was that Noir's sword was already imbued with armament hacky. In that moment of life and death, Smoker instinctively felt a sense of impending doom and twisted his body to withdraw his attack. This action saved his life. A shallow cut appeared on Smoker's chest, not far from his heart, bleeding slightly. Smoker broke into a cold sweat. Had he not withdrawn his attack, he might have been pierced. Pirate Hunter Noir could use Haki? Why is there such a powerful figure in East Blue? As a graduate of Marine Headquarters and a student of Zephyr, Smoker understood the terror of the Haki system. He had trained by developing his Devil Fruit ability and wasn't proficient in Haki, not even able to control the armament Haki at will. But this young man could? Smoker, still reeling, stared at Noir. With a faint smile, Noir said, Will you listen to me now, Captain? At that moment, Tashiji and the Marines arrived, guns pointed at Ace and Noir. Smoker, with a dark expression on his face, said to Noir, What do you want to say? Noir held up three fingers and said, First, I did not become a pirate. I'm still a hunter. Second, your marine intelligence says that Ace and I are on the same ship. In reality, his ship was destroyed, so he hitched a ride on mine. I didn't capture him because Ace had no bounty and I didn't want to deal with him. Third. Noir looked at the approaching Tashiji and said, I just helped you deal with the pirate who stole the children. Shouldn't you be paying me? Smoker said thoughtfully, so you're saying you didn't catch him because he had no bounty. Noir nodded confidently, exactly. Smoker showed a strange smile, pulled out a bounty notice from his subordinates, and said, Pirate Ace now has a bounty. You can catch him. What? Noir stared at Ace's bounty in shock. Good heavens, 40 million berries, and he hasn't even left East Blue yet? After seeing the bounty, Noir's eyes twinkled and he said cheekily, Forget it. I'm too lazy to catch him. I'm not short of money now. Smoker's face immediately darkened and he said coldly, are you messing with me? Noir, unfazed, smiled dangerously and said, What if I am? What can you do? The sky gradually darkened and a light drizzle began to fall, the tension between Noir and Smoker growing. It was then that Ace finally understood the situation. It seemed that Noir insulted the Marine because of him and couldn't be a pirate hunter anymore. That wouldn't do. Although Ace wanted Noir to be his partner, he wouldn't force him. Ace considered Noir a friend and he wouldn't push him. He had to help Noir. Ace looked at Noir and suddenly shouted, Ah! You bastard! Are you trying to catch me? Both Smoker and Noir were stunned. Noir looked at him in confusion. What was this silly guy doing now? In the drizzle, Ace's arm turned into flames as he lunged at Noir, pretending to yell, You won't catch me. As a fellow user of Flame Flame Fruit, Noir easily blocked his blow. Taking advantage of the close distance, he whispered, What are you doing? Ace chuckled, you're a pirate hunter, right? Come and get me. With that, 
Ace staggered back a few steps and said weakly, East Blue's strongest hunter, indeed. After his performance, Ace turned and ran with Deuce and Skull, leaving behind, help, me. Noir covered his face in embarrassment and lethargically ran after them, yelling, if you have the guts, don't run. The marines were stunned. Tashiji reported seriously to Smoker, it looks like Noir and Pirate Ace are not in cahoots. Not in cahoots, my ass. Smoker's veins bulged as he shouted at his naive subordinate. Such a bad act, no one would believe it. Even Vice Admiral Garp wouldn't believe it. Smoker's face turned livid as he roared, forget about Noir for now. Quick, capture the pirate poor gas D Ace. Thanks for listening. <laughs>